Chapter 81 With the storm of adverse editorial comment raised by Dirk's trial, Gary Courtney's chances in the coming election increased significantly. The Jingo Press spoke darkly of a surprise outcome which thinking men will welcome as a true assessment of the worth of the two candidates for the Ladyburg constituency. Only the Liberal papers reported the generous pension which the Ladyburg Wattle Cooperative Company voted to Norman Van Eck's widow and orphan. But everyone knew that Sean Courtney was still a long way ahead. He could be certain of the vote of the 200 men employed at the factory and on his estates, the other wattle producers of the valley and their employees, as well as a good half of the townsfolk and ranchers. That was until the Peter Maritzburg farmer and trader devoted a full front page to the exclusive story of one Archibald Frederick Longworthy. Mr. Longworthy related how, by the threat of physical violence and loss of employment, he had been forced to perjure himself in court, how, after the case, he had been summarily dismissed from his work. The exact nature of his perjury was not revealed. Sean cabled his lawyers in Peter Maritzburg to begin immediate proceedings against the farmer and trader for defamation of character, libel, contempt, treason and anything else that they could think of. Then, reckless of his own safety, he climbed into the rolls and raced at thirty miles an hour in pursuit of his cable. He arrived in Peter Maritzburg to find that Mr. Longworthy, after signing a sworn statement and graciously accepting a payment of fifty guineas, had departed without leaving a forwarding address. Legal advice was against Sean visiting the editor of The Farmer and Trader and laying himself open to a countersuit of assault and battery. It would be two months before the defamation trial was heard in court, and the election was to be held in ten days' time. All Sean could do was publish a full-page denial in each of the Liberal papers, then return to Ladyburg at a more sedate pace. There a telegram awaited him from Pretoria. Jan Polis and Jan Niemand suggested that in the circumstances it might be better if Sean withdraw from nomination. Sean's reply went sizzling back over the wires. Like a pair in harness, Gary and Sean Courtney swept up to the polling day finishing line. The actual voting took place in the Ladyburg Village Management Offices under the beady eyes of two government registration officers. Thereafter, the ballot boxes would be removed to Peter Maritzburg, where, on the following day, in the City Hall, the votes would be counted and the official results announced. On opposite sides of the square, the opposing candidates set up the large marquee tents from which free refreshments would be served to the voters. Traditionally, the candidate who fed the largest number would be the loser. Nobody wished to put their choice to additional expense, so they patronised the other man's stall. This day, however, both candidates served an almost equal amount of food. It was a day that threatened the approach of the wet season. Humid heat lay trapped beneath grey overcast clouds, and the occasional bursts of sunlight stung like the blast of an open furnace door. Sean, suited and waistcoated, sweated with anxiety as he greeted each visitor to his stall with a booming false camaraderie. Beside him Ruth looked like a rose petal and smelled as sweet. Storm, demure for once, stood between them. Dirk was not there. Sean had found work for him on the far side of Lioncop. Many sly eyes and snide sallies remarked his absence. Ronnie Pye had persuaded Gary not to wear his uniform. Anna was with him, pretty, in mauve and artificial flowers. It was only at closer range that the ugly little lines around her mouth and eyes and the grey hairs that were woven into the shiny black mass of her hair showed up. Neither she nor Gary let their eyes wander across the square. Michael arrived and spoke first with his father, kissed his mother dutifully, then crossed to resume the argument Sean had broken off the night before. Michael wanted Sean to buy ten thousand acres of the coastal lowlands around Tongart and plant it to sugarcane. Within a few minutes he realised that this was not the best time to push his idea. Sean greeted each of his points with hearty laughter and offered him a cigar. Discouraged but not resigned, Michael went into the ballot office and, settling his problem of divided loyalty, deliberately spoiled his paper. Then he returned to his office at the Wattle factory to whip his sugar estimates into shape for the next attack on Sean. Ada Courtney never left the Protea Street cottage all that day. She had steadfastly denied appeals to join either camp. 
and refused to allow any of her girls to help in the preparations. She had prohibited any political discussion in her house and ordered Sean to leave when he had disregarded this rule. Only after Ruth had interceded and Sean had made an abject apology was he allowed to return. She disapproved of the whole business and considered it undignified and common that members of her family should not only be standing for public office but actually competing for it. Her deep distrust of and contempt for officialdom stemmed from the time the village board had wanted to place street lamps along Proteus Street. She had attended their next meeting armed with an umbrella, and in vain they had tried to convince her that street lights did not attract mosquitoes. However, Ada was the only person in the district who did not attend. From mid-morning until polling closed at five o'clock, the square was jammed solid with humanity, and when the sealed ballot boxes were borne in state to the railway station, many of them climbed on the same train and went up to Peter Maritzburg for the official counting. It had been a day of unremitting nervous tension, so a very short time after entering their suite in the White Horse Hotel, Ruth and Sean fell into an exhausted sleep in each other's arms. When, in the early morning, a brilliant electrical storm raged down upon the town, Ruth moved restlessly in her sleep, coming slowly back to consciousness, and to the realisation that she and Sean were already engaged in the business that had been delayed so long. Sean woke at the same time, and for the few seconds that it took him to understand what was happening, was as bewildered as she. Then both of them went to it with a will. By dawn Ruth knew that she would bear a son, though Sean felt it was a little soon to tell for certain. After bathing, they ate breakfast in bed together with a renewed sense of intimacy, Ruth in a white silk gown with her hair loosed into a shiny mass on her shoulders and her skin glowing as though she had been freshly scrubbed, was extreme provocation to Sean. Consequently, they arrived late at the City Hall, much to the agitation of Sean's supporters. The counting was well advanced. In a roped-off section of the hall, ballot officers sat in silent industry at the tables piled with the small pink slips of paper. On a placard above each table was printed the name of the district and the candidates, and between the tables scrutineers paced watchfully. The body of the hall was filled with a milling, humming swarm of men and women. Before it engulfed them, Sean caught a glimpse of Gary and Anna moving through the press. Then for the next ten minutes he was subjected to an orgy of handshaking, back-slapping and well-wishes, interrupted by a bell and complete silence. The result for the Legislative Assembly seat of Newcastle, a high, thin voice announced in the hush. Mr. Robert Sampson, 986 votes. Mr. Edward Sutton, 423 votes. And the rest was lost in a burst of cheers and groans. Sampson was the South African Party candidate, and Sean fought his way through the pack that surrounded him. Well done, you old son of a gun, shouted Sean, and beat him between the shoulder blades. Thanks, Sean. Looks as though we're home and dry. I never expected a majority that size. And they wrung each other's hands deliriously. The morning went on with intervals of excited, buzzing tension, exploding into applause as each result was announced. Sean's confidence rose as his party captured each seat they had expected, and one that they were resigned to lose. But then the bell rang again, and in the same impersonal tone, the chief registration officer at last announced, The result for the Legislative Assembly seat of Ladyburg and the Lower Tugela. He felt the cold emptiness of apprehension in his stomach, and his breath burning up in the back of his throat. Standing beside him, he could sense the rigidity of Ruth's body, and he groped for her hand. Colonel Garrick Courtney, 638 votes. Colonel Sean Courtney, 631 votes. Ruth's hand squeezed hard, but Sean did not reply to the pressure. The two of them stood very still, a tiny island of quiet in the surge and roar, in the triumphant cheers and despairing groans, until Sean said softly, I think we'll go back to the hotel, my dear. Yes, she answered as softly and the sound of her voice was helpless pity. Together they started across the floor, and a way opened for them, 
a passage lined by faces that bore expressions of regret, happiness, curiosity, indifference, and triumphant malice. Out into the sunlight and across the street to the rank of higher cabs they walked together, while behind them the uproar was muted, sounding at this distance like the voices of wild animals. Sean handed Ruth up into the coach, and was about to join her before he remembered what there was still to be done. He spoke to the driver and gave him money before coming back to Ruth. Please wait for me at the hotel, my dear. Where are you going? I must offer Gary our congratulations. Through the screen of bodies that surrounded him, Gary saw Sean approaching, and he felt his body tensing involuntarily, racked by that conflict of hatred and love he bore for this man. Sean stopped in front of him and smiled. Well done, Gary, he said, and offered his right hand. You beat me in a hard, straight fight, and I'd like to shake your hand. Gary took the words up with temerity, examined them with growing realization of their meaning, and found that they were true. He had fought Sean and beaten him. This was something that could not be destroyed, something that Sean could never take away from him. I've beaten him. For the first time, the very first time in all my life. It was an emotional orgasm so intense that for a long moment Gary could not move or make any reply. Sean! His voice choked up. He caught Sean's outstretched hand in both of his and held it with desperate strength. Sean! Perhaps, perhaps now, he whispered. I'd, I'd like to, I mean, when we get back to Ladyburg. Then he stopped and blushed scarlet with embarrassment. Quickly he released Sean's hand and stepped back. I thought you might like to come out to Tunis Kral, he mumbled. Some day when you're, when you're not busy. Look around the old place. Then more eagerly. It's, it's been a long time, such a long time. I've still got Pa's old... Never! Anna Courtney hissed the word. Neither of them had noticed her across the hall, but now she appeared suddenly at Gary's side. Her eyes were bright gems of hatred set in their patterns of wrinkles, and her face was white as she glared at Sean. Never! she hissed again, and took Gary's arm. Come with me, she commanded, and Gary followed her meekly. But he glanced back at where Sean still stood, and there was a desperate plea in his eyes, a plea for understanding, for forgiveness of his weakness. Chapter 82 Like one who lives in a hurricane belt and recognises the shape of clouds and the breathless hush that precedes high wind, Ruth knew she would have to deal with the brooding, undirected rage, which would be Sean's reaction to his failure of his plans. His moods came at widely spaced intervals and did not last long, but she feared those moods of his, and like the prudent householder, forewarned of the hurricane's approach, she took precautions to minimise its wrath. When she reached the hotel, she sent an urgent summons to the manager. In half an hour I want lunch served in the suite. Not your ordinary bill of fare, something really good. The manager thought a moment. Oyster? We have a barrel just arrived from Amschlunger Rocks. Excellent, Ruth liked the man's response to the emergency. Uh, then I could do a smoked ham, cold venison, cold rock lobster, salads. Excellent again. What about cheese? Gruyere, Danish blue camembert. Wine? Uh, champagne? Yes, Ruth agreed instantly. She would shamelessly exploit Sean's weakness for it. A bottle of Verve Clicquot. No, on second thoughts, three bottles. I'll send the wine up first. Immediately, with your best glass and a silver bucket, Ruth told him. Then she fled to her toilet. Thank the Lord for French perfume, and this morning, dress of grey silk she had been saving for just such an occasion. She worked quickly, but with skill, upon her face and hair, and when she was finished she sat quietly before the mirror and composed her features into an expression of peace. The effect was very satisfactory, she decided after critical contemplation. Since it was the way he had first seen it, Sean could never resist her hair in braids. It made her look like a little girl. Shall I open the wine, madam? Yes, please, she called into the sitting room, then went through to await the onslaught of the hurricane. Ten minutes later it came wafting in like a gentle zephyr. 
with a cigar clamped between its teeth, its hands thrust deep into trouser pockets, and a bemused expression on its face. Hey now, Sean stopped when he saw her and removed the cigar. That's nice. The fact that he had noticed her appearance was proof that her weather forecast was hopelessly incorrect, and she burst out laughing. Oh, what's so funny? Sean asked mildly. Oh, nothing and everything. You and me. Have a glass of champagne. Mad woman, Sean said and kissed her. I like your hair like this. Aren't you disappointed? About the result, you mean? Yes, I suppose I am. He went to the central table and poured wine into the crystal glasses, handed one to her and took up the other. I give you a toast. The short, exciting political career of Sean Courtney. He wanted to win so badly. But now? Sean nodded. Yes, I always want to win. But now that the game is lost, he shrugged. Shall I tell you something? I was getting a bit sick of all the speechifying and handshaking. I feel that even in my sleep I have a vacant grin on my face. He crossed to one of the leather armchairs and sank down into it gratefully. There's something else also. Come here and let me tell you about it. She went to him, sat in his lap, and slid her hand into the front of his shirt so that she could feel the soft springy hair of his chest and the hard rubbery flesh beneath. Tell me, she said. And he told her about Gary. He spoke slowly, telling her everything. About the leg, how it was when they were children, and finally about Michael. She was quiet for a while, and he could see the hurt in her eyes that Sean had been another woman's lover. At last she asked, Does Gary know that Michael is your son? Yes. Anna told him one night. She told him the night I left Ladyburg. He wanted to kill me. Why did you leave? I couldn't stay on. Gary hated me for siring his son, and Anna hated me because I would not go to her. She still wanted you, then? Yes. That night, the night I left, Anna came to me and asked me to... Sean paused. She asked me to... Well, you, you know what I mean. Yes, Ruth nodded, hurt still and jealous, but making the effort to understand. I refused her, and she went to Gary, and in spite, she told him about the child. My God, what a poisonous bitch she is. But if she wanted you, why did she marry Gary? She was with child. She thought I had been killed in the Zulu War. She married him to provide a father for her child. I see, Ruth murmured. But why do you tell me this? I wanted you to understand how I feel about Gary. After what he did to you at that meeting, I can't expect you to have much sympathy for him. But he wasn't trying to hurt you. He was aiming at me. I owe him so much. I never seem able to pay him. That's why... That's why you're glad he won today, Ruth finished for him. Yes, Sean answered eagerly. You see, don't you, how important this must have been to him. For the first time he was able to... Able to... Sean fluttered his hands in frustration as he sought the words. He was able to compete with you on equal terms, Ruth supplied them for him. Exactly. Sean struck the arm of his chair with clenched fist. When I went to congratulate him, he was ready to meet me. He invited me out to Tunis Kral. Just then that evil bloody woman interfered and took him away. But somehow I know it's going to be all right now. A knock on the outer door interrupted him, and Ruth jumped up from his lap. That'll be the waiter with the lunch. But before she was halfway across the room, the knock was repeated with such insistence that it threatened to loosen the plaster. I'm coming, irritated, Ruth raised her voice and swung the door open. Led by Bob Sampson, a flood of men rushed into the room, jabbering and gesticulating. They bore down on Sean. What the hell's going on? he demanded. You've won, shouted Bob. A recount. You won on a recount by ten votes. My God, breathed Sean, and then so softly that only Ruth heard him. Gary. Poor Gary. Open that champagne. Send for another case. We're in solidly, all of us, exulted Bob Sampson. 
So let's drink to the Union of South Africa. Chapter 83 Not even this once. Out of so many times, so many things, not even this once. Already Gary Courtney was drunk. He lay deep in his chair with a tumbler held in both hands, stirring the brown liquid with a circular movement, so a few drops slopped over the rims and stained the cloth of his trousers. No, agreed Anna, not even this once. She stood with her back to him, staring out of the window of their suite into the gaslit street below, for she did not want him to see her face. But she could not control the harsh, gloating quality of her voice. Now you can go back to writing your little books. You've made your point. you proved to yourself and the rest of the world how effective you are. Moving her hands slowly, she began to massage her own upper arms with sensual pleasure. A tiny shudder thrilled her, so she moved restlessly, and her skirts rustled like leaves in the wind. God, how close it had been! And she had been afraid. You're a loser, Gary Courtney. You always have been, and you always will be. Again she shuddered with the memory of her fear. He had so nearly escaped. She had seen it begin from the moment the first result was announced. Every minute it had grown stronger. Even his voice had changed, deeper with the first hint of confidence in it. He had looked at her strangely, without submission, without the beginning of his contempt. Then the flare of rebellion, when he had spoken to Sean Courtney. She had been truly afraid then. You are a loser, she repeated, and heard the sound he made. Half gulp, half sigh. She waited, and when she heard the soft gurgle of brandy poured from the bottle to glass, she hugged herself tighter, and now she smiled as she remembered the announcement of the recount. The way he had shrunk, the way he had crumpled and turned to her with all of it gone, the confidence and contempt wiped away. Gone. Gone forever. Sean Courtney would never have him. She had made that oath, and now it would be kept. As so many times before, she played over in her mind the details of that night, the night she had made the oath. It was raining. She was standing on the wide stoop of Tunis Kral, and Sean was leading his horse up across the lawns of Tunis Kral. The damp linen of his shirt clung to his shoulders and chest. The rain had made his beard break out in tiny curls, so he looked like a mischievous pirate. "'Where's Gary?' her own voice and his voice answering. I oh, don't worry, he's gone into town to see Ada. He'll be back by supper time. Then he was coming up the steps towards her, standing tall above her, and his hand on her arm was cold from the rain. You must take better care of yourself now. You can't stand in the cold any more. And he had led her through the French doors. The top of her head was on a level with his shoulder, and his eyes, as he looked down at her, were gentle with masculine awe of pregnancy. You're a damn fine woman, Anna, and I'm sure you're going to make a fine baby. Sean. She remembered how his name had come up her throat like an involuntary exclamation of pain. The fierce forward surge that had flattened her body against his, back arching to send her hips forward, searching for his manhood. The coarse electric feeling of his hair in her hands as she pulled his face down and the taste of his mouth opened warm and moist. Are you mad? As he tried to break away from her, her arms locked around his body and her face pressed to his chest. I love you. Please, Sean, please, just let me hold you, that's all. I just want to hold you. Get away from me. And she felt herself thrown roughly onto the couch beside the fireplace. You're Gary's wife, and you'll soon be the mother of his child. Keep your hot little body for him. And his face thrust forward close to hers. I don't want you. I could no more touch you than I could go with my own mother. You're Gary's wife. If ever again you look at another man, I'll kill you. I'll kill you with my bare hands. Love congealing instantly, transformed to hatred by his words. Her fingernails raking across his cheek, so the blood slid into his beard, and he caught her wrists, holding her while she struggled and screamed at him. You swine, you dirty, dirty swine, Gary's wife, you say, Gary's baby, you say, now hear the truth. What I have within me, you put there. It's yours, not Gary's. 
Then he was backing away from her. You're lying, it can't be. Following him now, speaking those cruel words softly. You remember how we said goodbye when you went to war? You remember that night in the wagon? Leave me, leave me alone. I've got to think. I didn't know. And he was gone. She heard the door of his study slam, and she stood in the centre of the floor while the storm surf of her anger abated and exposed the black reefs of hatred beneath. Then she was alone in her bedroom, standing before the mirror, making her oath. I hate him. There's one thing I can take from him. Gary belongs to me now. Mine, not his. I will take that away from him. The pins pulled from her hair so it tumbled to her shoulders, her fingers tangling it into confusion, teeth closing on her own lips so she could taste the blood. Oh, God, I hate him, I hate him, she whispered through the pain, tearing open the blouse of her dress, watching in the mirror the great pink bosses of her nipples already darkening with the promise of fruition. I hate him! Pantaloons torn and discarded, bowls of face powder and cosmetics swept from the dressing table to burst and fill the room with the pungent reek of perfume. Then lying alone in the darkening room, waiting for Gary to come. Now she turned away from the window and looked down at Gary triumphantly, knowing he could never escape again. I have kept my oath, she thought, and crossed to the chair. Poor Gary, she forced her voice to croon gently, and she stroked the hair back from his forehead. He looked up at her, surprised, but eager for affection. Poor Gary, tomorrow we'll go home to Tunisgra. She moved the bottle on the side table closer to his hand. And then she kissed his cheek lightly and went on into the bedroom of the suite, smiling again, secure and safe in his weakness. Chapter 84 Four months passed quickly. Sean, distracted by the responsibilities of his office, the mountains of correspondence, the meetings and sessions, the petitioners and the schemers, offered only a token resistance to Michael's sugar plans. Michael went off to the coast, purchased the land, and became deeply involved with the seller's eldest daughter. This young lady had the dubious distinction of being one of the few divorcees in Natal. When the scandal reached his ears, Sean, secretly pleased that Michael's chastity was at last shed, boarded the rolls and went off on a flying mission of rescue. He returned to Ladyburg with a penitent Michael in tow. Two weeks later, the young lady married a travelling salesman and moved from Tongard to Durban, whereupon Michael was allowed to return to Tongart and begin the development of the sugar estate. Ruth no longer accompanied Sean on all of his absences from Ladyburg. Her swiftly increasing girth and a mild malady which assailed her in the mornings kept her at Lionkop, where she and Ada spent much time in the design and fabrication of baby wear. In this storm rendered assistance. The matinee jacket, which took three months to knit, was certain to fit the infant perfectly, provided it was a hunchback with its one arm twice as long as the other. Kept busy from early morning to nightfall in the capacity of overseer on Mahuba's Kloof, Dirk found little time for distraction. Ladyburg was now well covered by Sean's espionage system, and Dirk's few visits were reported in detail. But on the far side of Ladyburg, derelict and shabby from want of love, brooded the great homestead of Tuniskral. In the night, a single window showed a pale yellow square of light, as Gary Courtney sat alone at his desk. In front of him lay a pathetically thin sheaf of papers. Hour after hour he stared at it, but no longer seeing it. He was dry inside, deprived of the juice of life and seeking its substitute in the bottle, which was always near him. The days drifted into weeks, and they in turn became months, and he drifted with them. Each afternoon he would go down to the paddocks then. Leaning against the heavy wooden paling, he would watch his bloodstock. Hour after hour he stood unmoving, and it seemed that, in time, he left his own body and lived within those richly gleaming skins, as though his own hooves drove deep into the turf as he ran, as though his own voice squealed and his muscles bunched and moved in the savage mating of heavy bodies. Ronnie Pye found him there one afternoon. Without Gary being aware of his presence, he came up silently and stood beside him, studying the pale, intense face 
with the chisel marks of pain and doubt and terrible yearning sculptured deep around the mouth and below the pale blue eyes. Hello, Gary, he spoke softly, but recognising the pity in his own voice, he thrust it aside. There was no room for softness now, and ruthlessness had hardened his resolve. Uh, Ronnie, vaguely Gary turned to him, and when he smiled it was shyly. Uh, business or social? Uh, business, Gary. The bond? Yes. Uh, what do you want me to do? Uh, how about coming into town? We can go over things in my office. Now? Yes, please. Very well. Gary straightened up slowly. I'll come with you. They rode together over the crest of ground and came towards the concrete bridge over the baboon stream, both of them silent. Gary, because there was nothing in him, nothing to give voice to. Ronnie Pye, because of his sense of shame for the thing he was about to do. He was going to take a man's home from him and turn him loose upon a world in which he would have no chance of survival. At the bridge they stopped automatically to rest their horses, and they sat without speaking, an incongruous pair, one man sitting quietly, slim and wasted, his clothing slightly rumpled, his face austere with suffering, the other plump, red-faced, below bright ginger hair, dressed in expensive cloth, fidgeting in the saddle. There was little sign of life across the river, a long, tired smear of smoke from the wattle factory stack rising straight into the still hot air, a black boy moving cattle down to drink at the river, the huff and clatter and clang of a locomotive shunting in the goods yards. But otherwise the town of Ladyburg lay slumbering in the heat of a summer afternoon. Then, on the open grassy plain below the escarpment, urgent movement caught Ronnie's eye, and he focused his attention upon it with relief. A horseman riding fast, and even at this distance Ronnie recognised him. A young Dirk, he grunted, and Gary roused himself and peered out across the river. Horse and rider blended into one unit, seeming to touch the earth so lightly they were bound to it only by a pale feather of dust that drifted low behind them. My God, that little bastard can ride! In reluctant admiration, Ronnie shook his head solemnly, and a drop of perspiration broke from his hairline and slid down his cheek. The horse reached the road and pivoted neatly, flattening into the increased speed of its run movement of such rhythmic grace and power that the watchers were stirred. A look at him go, whistled Ronnie. Don't reckon there's anything to catch that horse in the whole of Natal. You think so? Gary's voice was suddenly alive, and his lips were pursed in anger. I'm damned certain of it. Mine. My colt. Grey weather. Over a point-to-point -point course I'd match him against any of Sean Courtney's stud. And those words gave Ronnie Pye the idea. He turned it over in his mind, while with slightly narrowed eyes he watched Dirk Courtney race Sundancer down towards the wattle factory. When horse and rider had disappeared through the tall gates, Ronnie spoke softly. Would you back your colt with money? I'd back him with my life. There was savagery in Gary's voice. Yes, thought Ronnie. Now this way at least I will give him a chance. This way the fates will make the decision. There will be no blame to my account. Would you back it with Tunis Kral? he asked, and the silence drew out. How do you mean? whispered Gary. If you win, the bond on Tunis Kral is set aside. And if I lose? You lose the farm. No, snapped Gary. Christ, no, that's too much. Ronnie shrugged indifferently. It was just an idea. You're probably wise. You wouldn't have had much of a chance against Sean. Gary gasped sharply. That challenge had wounded deep as a lance, made it a direct competition between Sean and himself. To ignore it would be to admit he could never win. I'll take the bet. The whole bet? You'll cover my money with what you have left of Tunis Kral? Yes, damn you. Yes, I'll show you how much chance I have against him. We'd better get it down in writing, Ronnie suggested gently. Then I'll see if I can arrange it with Sean. He touched his mount with his spurs, and they moved forward across the bridge. By the way, I think it best we tell nobody about our little bet. 
We'll pretend it's just an honour match. Gary nodded his agreement. But that night, when he wrote to Michael, he told him about it, then went on to plead with Michael to ride grey weather in the race. Two days before the competition, Michael confided in his grandmother. Ada went out to Tunis Kral to try and dissuade Gary from this reckless gamble, without success. Gary was almost fanatical in his determination. The stake meant nothing to him. It was the prospect of winning. And now he had grey weather and Michael to run for him. This time, he would win. This time. Chapter 85 In the dark, Sean walked with Dirk down the lane to the stables. The clouds banked along the escarpment, were fired red by the hidden sun, and the wind fretted through the plantations so that the wattle moaned and shook. North wind, grunted Sean. It'll rain before nightfall. Sundancer loves the rain, Dirk answered him tensely, and Sean glanced at him. Dirk, if you lose today, he started, but Dirk cut him short. I won't lose, and again as though it were a vow. I won't lose. If you would only show as much determination in other things, the more important... Important? Pa, this is important. This is the most important thing I've ever done. Dirk stopped and turned to his father. He caught Sean's sleeve, clinging to him. Pa, I'm doing this for you, for you, Pa. Sean looked down, and what he saw in his son's face, in that beautiful face, silenced the retort that he was about to make. Where did I go wrong with you, he asked himself with love stained by loathing. Where did you get this blood? Why are you this way? demanded his pride and his contempt. Thanks, he said, dryly, freed his arm and walked on towards the stables. Sightless in his deep preoccupation with Dirk, Sean was into the stable yard before he noticed Mbijani. Gorsi, I see you. Mbijani rose solemnly from the hand-carved stool on which he sat. I see you also, Sean cried with pleasure, and then controlled himself. A display of emotion in front of lesser persons would embarrass Mbijani. You are well? he asked gravely, and restrained the desire to prod the swelling dignity of Mbijani's stomach, reminding himself that Mbijani's abundant flesh and fat had been carefully cultivated as a sign to the rest of the world of his prosperity. I am well, Mbijani assured him. That you have come gives me great pleasure. Gorsi, on a day of importance, it is right that we should be together, as it was before. And Imbijani allowed himself to smile for the first time, a smile that within seconds became a mischievous grin that Sean gave back to him. He should have guessed that Imbijani would never miss a fight, or a hunt, or a contest. Then Imbijani turned to Dirk. Do us honour today, he commanded, as though he spoke to one of his own sons. Your father and I will be watching you. He placed a huge black hand upon Dirk's shoulder, as though in benediction. Then he turned to gesture with his fly-whisk at the stable boys waiting behind him. Bring the horse. Two of them led her out, her hooves ringing on the paving of the yard as she danced a little. Head up, moving, greyhound bellied, pricking her ears forward and back, she saw Dirk, and wrinkled the soft velvet of her nostrils as she wickered. "'Hey, girl!' Dirk walked towards her. At his approach she rolled her eyes until the whites showed, and her small, dainty ears flattened wickedly against her neck. "'Stop that nonsense!' Dirk admonished, and she bared yellow teeth menacingly, and reached with her slender, snake-like neck. He put out his hand to her, and she took his fingers between those terrible teeth and nibbled them tenderly. Then, finished with pretense, she snorted, pricked her ears, and nuzzled his chest and neck. "'Where's her blanket? Has she eaten? Put the saddle and bridle in the car!' Dirk snapped a chain of questions and instructions at the stable boys as he caressed Sundancer's face with the gentle hands of a lover. So many contradictions in one person. Sean watched his son with sadness heavy upon him, oppressive as this red dawn. Where did I go wrong? Ngorsi, I will walk down with the horse, Imbijani sensed his mood and sought to end it. Better that a man of your station should ride with me in the motor car, 
Sean demurred, and took a fiendish pleasure in the shifty glance that Imbajani cast at the great gleaming rolls parked at the far end of the yard. It has eyes like a monster, thought Imbajani, and looked quickly away. I will walk with the horse and see that it comes to no harm, he announced. As you wish, Sean agreed. The small procession set off towards Ladyburg, the two grooms leading Sundancer in her red tartan blanket, and Imbijani following sedately with his small black sons carrying his carved stool and his spears behind him. Two hours later, Sean drove the rolls into the field behind the stockyards. Staring straight ahead, both hands gripping the wheel so that the knuckles of his hands gleamed white, Sean did not hear the shouted greetings nor see the gala crowds and the bunting until the rolls bumped to a halt in the grass and his hands unfroze slowly from the wheel. Then he exhaled gently, and the rigid muscles of his face softened into a grin of uncertain triumph. "'Well, we made it,' he spoke as if he were not quite certain. "'You did very well, my dear,' Ruth's voice was also a little scratchy, and she relaxed her protective hold on Storm. "'You should let me drive, Pa,' Dirk was lounging against the saddlery on the back seat. Sean turned furiously upon him. But Dirk was too quick. He flung open the door and was absorbed into the crowd that had gathered around the rolls before Sean could assemble his words. Sean glowered after him. Hello, Sean. Nice to see you. Dennis Peterson had opened the door at his elbow, and Sean hastily rearranged his features into a smile. Oh, hello, Dennis. Nice turnout. Everybody in the district, Dennis assured him, as they shook hands, and then looked with satisfaction around the field. There were at least fifty carriages parked haphazard along the stockyard fence. An open wagon had been arranged as a refreshment stall, with silver urns of coffee and piles of cakes laid out upon it. A dogfight was in progress near the gate, while small boys in already wilted church clothes shrieked and whooped and chased each other through the crowd. "'Who's responsible for the decorations?' Sean asked, surveying the flags and bunting that fluttered from the poles that marked the finishing line, and from the wide, roped-off lane that led up to them. "'The board. We voted it last week. Very nice.' Sean was looking now at the stock pen, where the horses were. A solid barricade of humanity lined the railings. But he saw Dirk climb over and jump down beside Sundancer, amid a splatter of applause from the onlookers. "'Good-looking lad,' Dennis was watching Dirk also. But there was something in his tone that added, "'But I'm glad he's not mine.' Thanks. The defiance in Sean's voice was not lost on Dennis, and he smiled ironically. We better go across and talk to the other judges. Garrick is waiting. Dennis jerked his head towards the carriage at the end of the line. And although he had been painfully aware of it, Sean looked at it for the first time. Together with Pi, Erasmus and his father, Michael was standing beside it watching them, tall and lean in tight black riding boots, and an open shirt of white silk, Accentuating the breadth of his shoulders, he leaned against the wheel. Above him, Ada and Anna sat together on the rear seat, and suddenly Sean felt a twist of anger in his stomach that Ada should be there with them. Mother, he greeted her without smiling. Hello, Sean, and he could not fathom the tone of her voice nor her expression. Was it regret, or perhaps a reluctant rejection? For a long minute they held each other's eyes, until at last Sean had to break, because now, instead of anger, he felt guilty. But he did not understand the source of his guilt. It was only the sorrowful accusation in Ada's eyes that had given it to him. Anna, he greeted her, and received in exchange a stiff nod. Gary, Sean tried to smile. He made a movement to lift his right hand, but as he did so he knew it would be rejected for the same accusation that he had seen in Ada's eyes was also in Gary's. He turned with relief to Michael. Hello, Mike. You know you're going to get the pants thrashed off you, don't you? I'm going to make you eat those words without salt. And they laughed together, easily, laughed with such obvious joy in each other that Anna moved restlessly in her seat and spoke sharply. Can't we get it over with, Ronnie? Yes, Ronnie Pye agreed hastily. Well, then, where is young Dirk? We'd better go and find him. In a group, they left the women and moved through the crowd towards the stock pen where Dirk stood laughing with two girls, 
that Sean recognized as daughters of one of the factory foremen. They were both looking up at Dirk and reacting with such unashamed adoration that Sean felt a little lift of indulgent pride. Casually, Dirk dismissed the girls and came across to meet them. All set, Pa. Yes, so I see, Sean gruffed, and waited for Dirk to show courtesy to the men with him. But Dirk ignored them and spoke only to Ronnie Pye. Well, let's hear it. Well, then, a contest between Gary Courtney's Colt Greyweather and Sean Courtney's Philly Sundancer. An honour match with no stake put up by the owners. Agreed? Right, said Sean. Gary opened his mouth and then closed it firmly and nodded. He was sweating a little. He unfolded the handkerchief in his hand and wiped his forehead. The distance approximately five miles around four points, the points being firstly the posts that have been erected on this field, secondly the northeastern boundary marker of the farm Tunis Kral, Ronnie pointed at the crest of the escarpment that stood above them, its slope golden with grass in the morning sun, and smeared with streaks of dark green bush. Thirdly, the number three dip tank of Mkhubukskloof Farm, which you can't see from here as it is behind those trees. Ronnie's arm described a long arc along the crest of the escarpment, and stopped pointing at the spires of a clump of saligna gums. But both of you know it? Sure, agreed Dirk, and Michael nodded. The fourth and finishing point is the same as the starting point. Here. He jerked his thumb at the two posts that fluttered gay with flags. Stewards have been posted at the Tunis Kral boundary and the dip tank. Make sure you pass on the far side of them. The judges are Messrs. Peterson, Erasmus and myself. All in any dispute regarding the running or interpretation of the rules will be decided by us. Ronnie went on talking, and Sean felt his excitement mounting from his stomach and beginning to tingle along his forearms. It was taking a hold on all of them now. Even Ronnie's voice had an edge to it. Though Sean did not understand that the fox-like eagerness of his face came from the knowledge that this was a contest in which he stood to gain more than any of them. But Garrick understood fully, and his eyes watched Ronnie's lips hypnotically. Well, that's it, then, Ronnie finished, and then to the riders. Well, get saddled up and bring your horses to the start. The judges walked away and left the four Courtneys standing together. Sean, Gary spoke first. His eyes were stricken. I, I think you should know, but he did not finish. What? Sean asked abruptly. And at the tone of his voice, Garrick straightened up. The thing in his eyes changed shape and became what Sean had never expected to see there. Pride. It doesn't matter. Gary turned away and walked purposefully towards his horse, and there was a spring in his stride and a set to his shoulders. Good luck, Mike, Sean punched his arm. And the same to you, Michael started after Garrick, then stopped and turned back to Sean. Whatever anyone else says, Sean, I know you didn't plan this. Then he was striding away. What the hell did he mean by that? puzzled Sean. But Dirk cut into his thoughts. Why did you have to do that, Pa? he demanded. Uh, what? Sean looked at him uncomprehendingly. Give him luck. Why did you have to give him luck? I'm riding for you, not him. I'm your son, not him. The two riders moved together towards the start, and buzzing with excitement the crowd went with them. Sean walked beside Sundancer with Dirk leaning attentively from the saddle to listen to him. Take it gently to the swamp, don't push her, for she'll need all her steam in the mud. Michael will gain there, that colt is strong in the leg but heavy. Follow him and let him break a path for you. Out of the swamp you can catch up and pass him on the slope. Push hard there. You must lead him to the top and hold your lead along the crest to the dip tank. All right, Pa. Now, when you start down again, keep well out beyond the Van Essen plantation, onto the hard ground. That way you can cut the edge of the swamp. My guess is that Michael comes straight down and plough through the middle. But you must take the longer route and use Sundancer's speed against Greyweather's strength. They had reached the starting posts, and the crowd scattered and spread away to line the ropes. An open funnel of humanity faced the two horsemen. 
then the swamp with its deceptively lush papyrus grass concealing the glutinous mud holes. Beyond it, the great soar of the escarpment. A long course, a hard course. Are both of you ready? called Ronnie Pye from the sidelines. Clear the field, please, Sean. Sean put his hand on Dirk's knee. Well, let's see what you can do, boy. Then he ducked under the ropes into the crowd. Sundancer was skittering nervously, coming up on her back legs and throwing her head so that the mane flew red gold in the sunlight. She was sweating in dark patches on her shoulders. Michael was circling grey weather, keeping him moving gently, leaning forward and patting his neck, talking to him, so that he switched his ears, cocking them half back to listen. Quiet, please, everybody. Dennis was using a megaphone, and the buzz of voices descended into an expectant hush. You're under starter's orders now, he shouted at the riders. Turn wide and walk up together. They swung away from the posts and came together. Dirk touched Sundancer with the spur, and she jumped back, thrusting her quarters into Michael's leg. Keep your bloody animal under control, he snarled at Michael. Don't crowd me. Are you nervous, Dirky? Obediently, Michael wheeled his mount aside. Damn you! I'll show you who's nervous! And Sundancer threw her head in protest, and Dirk soared her with the curb. Come round! Swing them round! Dennis's voice through the megaphone boomed distortedly. They turned in line and started walking up, twenty paces from the start, two horses with the sunlight glowing on their polished skins, pale gold and dark red. The crowd sighed softly, like wind in the grass. Ten paces and Sundancer was pushing forward, lengthening her stride, crabbing a little. Hold your line! Keep together! Dennis cautioned them, and Dirk yanked her back roughly. The rims of his nostrils were flared and white with tension. Michael moved up beside him, holding his hands low, the big red colt stepping high in the exaggerated action of an animal under restraint. Quickening together over the last five paces, their riders hunching low in the saddles, they came to the posts. Go! bellowed Dennis. And go, go! roared a hundred voices. Still in line, matching each other's stride, they changed from a walk into an easy, free, swinging canter. Both Dirk and Michael rising slightly in their stirrups to hold them from headlong flight. Half a mile ahead lay the swamp and beyond it five miles of mountain and rough rocky ground, of donga and thornbush. They cantered down between the yelling lines and out of the funnel into the open. The crowd broke and scattered to various points of vantage, and Sean ran with them, unslinging his binocular case, chuckling with excitement in the general confusion of shouts and laughter. Ruth was waiting for him beside the rolls, and he caught her around the waist and lifted her onto the bonnet, "'Sean, you'll scratch the paintwork,' she protested, as she clutched at her hat and teetered dangerously on the high, round bonnet. "'Oh, the hell with the paintwork!' he laughed, as he climbed up beside her, and she clung to him for support. "'There they are!' Far out across the field, the two horses ran down towards the bright green of the swamp. Sean lifted and focused his binoculars, and suddenly they were so close he expected to hear the drumming of the hooves. Grey Weather was pulling ahead, forcing powerfully, with his great shoulders lunging into each stride, and Sun Dancer trailed him with her neck arched against the pressure of the bit. On her back, Dirk sat upright with his elbows pressed into his flanks as he held her. Now oh, the little bugger is listening to advice, Sean growled. I quite expected him to be using the whip already. Across the distance that separated them, Sean could feel as a tangible thing Dirk's determination to win. He could see it in the way he held his shoulders. He could see it in the rigid lines of his arms. But what he did not see were the harsh lines of hatred in Dirk's face as he stared at Michael's back ahead of him. The beat of hooves changed its tone, no longer ringing on hard ground, but dulling as they reached the swamp. Now lumps of damp clay flew from Grey Weather's hooves, and a piece hit Dirk's chest and sprayed dirt on the white silk of his shirt. Sundancer's gait altered as she felt the soft ground. "'Easy, girl. Hey there, girl,' Dirk whispered, and held her firmly with his knees to give her confidence. The grass brushed his stirrups, and ahead of him grey weather splashed into the first mud hole. 
plunged through it and into the swamp proper. The tall papyrus engulfed him. Ah, the old man was right, Dirk smiled for the first time. Michael was forcing a path through the reeds, flattening them for Dirk to follow with half the effort. Twice grey weather sunk to his belly in potholes of black glue, rearing and struggling to free himself while Dirk skirted them. Both horses were shiny with mud, and their riders were soaked to the waist and splattered above. The swamp stank like an animal cage, and marsh gas erupted sullenly as they disturbed it. Clouds of insects rose about them. A sakabula bird fled shrieking as they ploughed through the papyrus. One of the razor leaves lashed Michael's cheek, and a thread of blood ran down his jaw, washing the blobs of mud with it, and dripped onto his shirt. Then suddenly the ground firmed under them. The solid papyrus broke into clumps, thinned, and was left behind, and grey weather led them out onto the first slope of the escarpment. He was running heavily now and grunting with each stride, while Sundancer moved up beside him. You're finished! Dirk shouted at Michael as they drew level. I'll see you at the finish line! And he leaned forward in the saddle and gave Sundancer the spurs and the whip together. Without pressing his horse, Michael angled him off towards the right, letting him move under slack rein to pick his own way, and he began the first leg of a series of zigzags that would take him to the top. On the steep ground below the crest, Dirk used the whip incessantly, and Sundancer went up in a series of scrambling leaps, with the loose rock rolling under her hooves. The sweat had washed away the mud from her shoulders, and she landed with less control at each jump. Pull, you bitch, pull! Dirk shouted at her, and looked back in agony at Michael's sedate ascent. He was two hundred yards below and coming steadily. Dirk's movement caught Sundancer off balance, and she landed awkwardly at the next jump. Her hooves scrabbled, and she started to fall. Dirk kicked his feet from the stirrups, and jumped with the reins still in his hands. The instant he landed, he leaned back on the reins to hold her, but she was down on her knees now, sliding back, and she pulled Dirk down with her onto the level place below. They struggled together, and when at last he got her on her feet, she was trembling with terror. Dust and pieces of dry grass coated her muddy legs. "'Damn you! Damn you, you clumsy bitch!' whispered Dirk, as he ran his hands over her hocks to check for damage. He glanced back at Michael, and found him much closer now. "'Oh, God!' he blurted, snatched up Sundancer's reins, and ran up the slope, dragging her after him. Dirk came out on the crest with sweat pouring down his face and soaking through his shirt. Saliva had dried to a thick gummy froth in his mouth, and he was panting harshly. But he had held on to his lead, and Sundancer was over her trembling fit. She had recovered sufficiently to cavort a little as he mounted. "'This way, Dirky!' the two stewards standing on the pile of stones that marked the Tunis Kral boundary were waving and shouting wild encouragement. Dirk clouted the spurs into her and was off again, galloping along the ridge, sweeping past them and on towards the clump of gums three miles ahead. "'Catch him, Mike! Ride, man, ride!' faint shouts behind him, and Dirk knew without looking back that Mike had reached the top and was chasing him. He rode on, grimly mourning the time lost on the ascent, and hating both Sundancer and Michael for it. At this point he should have led by four hundred yards, not fifty. Directly ahead now was the gorge through which the Baboonstrom dropped down the escarpment, its side choked with dark green river bush. Dirk found the path and turned away from the skyline, aiming upstream at the ford. Without grass to muffle them, Sundancer's hooves hammered in staccato rhythm on the hard-packed earth of the path. But also he could hear behind him, like an echo, the beat of other hooves. Michael was onto the path behind him. Dirk looked back under his own arm. Michael was so close that he could see the laughter lines creasing the corners of his mouth, and the mockery inflamed him. I'll show him. And Dirk started with the whip again, cracking it across Sundancer's flanks and shoulders, so that she jumped forward with a new urgency. Down the steep bank of the river, and out onto the white sand bank, he plunged with Greyweather's nose drawing level with his boot. Into the dark green water they rode abreast, throwing up a veil of spray that sparkled in the sunlight, slipping from their saddles to swim beside the horses through the deep while the current moved them towards the falls. Up into the saddles again, the instant the horses found the bottom and splashed towards the far bank. 
out onto the sand with water streaming from sodden clothing, shouting with excitement as they raced for the narrow path that climbed the far bank. First man onto it would hold the advantage. Give way, give way, I'm leading, give me way, screamed Dirk furiously. Make your own way, Michael laughed back at him. You bastard! Dirk used his knees and reins to thrust Sundancer's shoulder into Michael, trying to force him clear. None of that, Michael warned him. You bastard, I'll show you. They rode knee to knee. Dirk sat up quickly and twisted his foot, placing his booted toe under Michael's instep. With a sudden vicious lift of his leg, he slipped Michael's foot from the stirrup and threw him sideways. As he felt himself going over, Michael clutched desperately at the pommel, pulling the saddle with him so it slid onto Greyweather's flank, and the shift of weight forced the horse to disengage and slew away from the path. Michael went down onto his shoulder into the sand and rolled with his knees drawn up against his stomach. "'That's for you!' Dirk yelled in defiance as he went up the bank and out into the open felt again. Behind him in the riverbed Michael staggered to his feet, his wet clothing coated white with sand, and ran after Greyweather, who was trotting back towards the water with the saddle hanging under his chest. "'The dirty little swine! My God, if only Sean knew!' Michael caught the horse before it started to drink, wrestled the saddle onto his back again and clinched the girth. Now I can't let him win. He jumped up onto grey weather and booted him towards the bank. I can't let him win. Two hundred yards ahead, Dirk's shirt was a white blob against the brown grass. As he rounded the dip tank and pointed Sundancer's head at the ridge for the last leg, one of the stewards shouted, What happened to Michael? He fell in the river, Dirk called back. He's finished and his voice rang with triumph. "'He's leading! Dirk's leading!' Sean stood on the rolls with his glasses trained on the clump of gum trees, and now he was the first to spot the tiny figure of the horseman as it showed on the crest of the escarpment. "'Where's Michael?' Ruth asked. "'He can't be far behind,' Sean muttered and waited anxiously for him to appear. He had fretted while he watched Dirk's reckless ascent of the slope, and cursed him loudly for his brutal treatment of Sundancer. Then he had entreated him to get a bloody move on during the run along the ridge, with Michael gaining steadily on him. When the two horsemen had veered away from the skyline to cross the Baboonstrom, they had disappeared from view, and this was the first glimpse the spectators had received of either competitor since that moment. The little idiot's riding too wide. I told him to cut the edge of the swamp, not ride round it altogether. Where's Michael? Ruth repeated. Sean swung the glasses back and scanned the crest with the first twinges of concern. Not showing yet. He must have run into trouble. Do you think he's all right? Has he been hurt? Well, how should I know? Sean's anxiety made him irritable, but immediately he was penitent, and encircled Ruth's waist with his arm. He can look after himself, that one, no sense in fussing about him. Dirk was well down the slope now, leaving a thin trail of dust, for Sundancer skidded on her haunches most of the way. Still no sign of Michael. Ruth moved restlessly against him. No, not yet, Sean grunted. Dirk can afford to miss the swamp. He's leading by a quarter of a mile. Suddenly a sigh of relief moved the crowd like a gust of wind through a field of wheat. There he is. He's coming straight down the slope. He can't make it unless he flies. Sean swung his glasses from Dirk to Michael and back, estimating their speeds and positions allowing for Michael's delay in the swamp, but setting against that the additional distance that Dirk had to cover. It's going to be close, he decided aloud. Dirk's got the edge, but it's going to be very close. Ada did not see it that way. Dirk was leading, and Dirk was going to win. She looked across at Garrick. He stood beside the finishing post a hundred yards away, but even at that distance there was no mistaking the droop of his shoulders and the air of misery that surrounded him like an aura of defeat. Sundancer's hooves were slashing his life to threads. Unable to bear it a moment longer, Ada jumped down from the carriage and ran through the crowd to where Sean stood like a triumphant colossus on the bonnet of the rolls. Sean! She reached up and touched his leg, but he was so engrossed he did not feel or hear her. Sean! She shouted and tugged at his trouser leg. Mother! He turned vaguely to look down at her. "'I must talk to you,' Ada shouted above the sound of the crowd that was rising with excitement. "'Or not now! They're coming into the finish! 
Climb up here where you can see it. Now. I must speak to you. Now. Come down this instant. Her tone shocked him. For a second he wavered and peered furtively back at the race. Then he shrugged with resignation and jumped down beside her. What is it? Please be quick. I don't want to miss... I'll be quick. Sean had never seen such a cold fury on her before. I wanted to say that I never thought I'd see that day, when I had nothing left for you but contempt. Thoughtless you've been often, but never downright merciless. Mother, I... He was bewildered. Listen to me. You set out to destroy your brother, and you've done it. Well, I hope you've had pleasure of it. You've got Tunis Kral now. Enjoy it, Sean. Sleep well at night. Tunis Kral? What do you mean? He shouted at her now in confusion. I didn't wager for the farm. Oh, no, Ada scoffed at him. Of course you didn't. You let Ronnie Pye do that for you. Pye? Well, what has he got to do with it? Everything. He helped you plan it. He helped you provoke Gary into the stupidity. He holds the mortgage on Tunis Kral. But... Slowly, the enormity of it all began to shape up in Sean's mind. You took his leg. Now take Tunis Kral, but pay for it with my love. She looked steadily into his eyes, but the pain was there, clouding her own. Goodbye, Sean. We won't speak to each other again. And she walked slowly away. She walked like an old woman at last, a tired and worn old woman. Sean understood and began to run towards the finishing line. He drove through the crowd like a shark through a shoal of sardines. Over their heads he saw the two horsemen galloping in across the field. Dirk was leading, standing in the stirrups to thrash Sundancer with the whip. His black hair fluttered in the wind, and his shirt filthy with thrown mud. Under him the filly danced on flying hooves, and the beat of them drummed above the rising roar of the crowd. Her body was black and shiny with sweat, and froth flew from her gaping pink mouth to form white lace on her chest and flanks. Fifty hopeless yards behind her plunged the colt with Michael flogging his heels into him with despair. Michael's face was twisted in an agony of frustration. Grey weather was finished, his legs loose with exhaustion, and his breath sawing hoarsely with each stride. Sean tore his way through the press of bodies that lined the guide ropes. He reached the front rank and shouldered two women from his path. Then he stooped and ducked under the rope into the open. Sundancer was almost up to him, hammering down in a crescendo of hooves, her head nodding with each stride. Dirk! Stop her! Sean roared. Pa! Pa, get out of the way! Dirk screamed back at him. But Sean sprang to intercept him. Pa! Sean was in front of him, crouching with arms extended, too close to swing Sundancer's head away from him, too late to stop her charge. Jump, girl, jump, shouted Dirk, and gathered the horse with his knees, feeling her respond with a bunching of her quarters, feeling her lift her forelegs against her chest and drive upwards in a high parabola. But sensing also the sluggishness of her exhausted body, and knowing she had not gone high enough to clear Sean's head. An aching moment as Sundancer lifted clear of the ground. The horrified groan of the crowd as her forelegs smashed into Sean, and she twisted in the air, falling. Dirk thrown, his stirrup leathers parting like whip cracks, then all of them down together in the grass, shrill screams of women in the crowd. Sundancer struggling up again, with a foreleg swinging loosely from the knee, whinnying in the pain of broken bone. Sean on his back, his head twisted to the side, and blood from his torn cheek, dribbling into his nose and mouth, so that his breathing snored hoarsely. Dirk, with the skin smeared from elbows and one cheek, crawling towards Sean, kneeling beside him, raising both hands clenched, hammering down with them so that his fists splattered the blood, beating them into the chest and slack, unconscious face of his father. Why did you... Oh, God, I hate you! Shock and fury and despair. For you... You stop me, you stop me. Michael dragging Grey Weather down on his haunches, flinging from the saddle, running to them, holding Dirk's arms, dragging him off, fighting him. Leave him, you little bastard. He didn't want me to. He stopped me. I hate him. I'll kill him. The crowd surging forward, flattening the guide ropes, two men helping Michael hold Dirk, the rest of them wringing Sean's body. 
the cries and questions. Where's Doc Fraser? Jesus, he's badly hurt. Catch that horse. Get a gun. What about the bets? Don't touch him. Wait. Got to straighten his arm. Get a gun. For Christ's sake, get a gun. Then a new silence on them, their ranks opening quietly, and Ruth coming in through to him, running, in Bajani behind her. Sean. She knelt beside him, clumsy in her pregnancy. Sean. She began again, and the men about her could not look at her face. In Bajani. Bring him to the car, she whispered. He slipped the monkey-skin cloak from his shoulder and let it drop, stooped over Sean and lifted him. The great black muscles of his chest and arms swelled, and he stood with his legs braced wide against the weight. His arm, in Kuzakasi. She arranged the hanging arm comfortably across his chest. Bring him, she repeated, and together they walked through the crowd. Sean's head lolled against Mbijani's shoulder, like that of a sleeping child. Mbijani laid Sean gently on the back seat with his head in Ruth's lap. My daddy, she kept repeating, her face screwed up with horror at the blood and her tiny body trembling like that of a frightened rabbit. Will you drive us, please, Michael? Ruth looked up at him as he stood beside the rolls. Take us to Protea Street. With Mbijani loping alongside, the big car bumped across the field through the throng of anxious watchers, then swung onto the main road and moved away towards Ladyburg. Chapter 86 while about him the crowd scattered slowly and drifted to their carriages, Dirk Courtney stood alone and watched the rolls disappear in its own blown dust. Waves of reaction shivered up his legs and turned to heavy nausea in his gut. The open gravel rash on his face burned like acid spilled upon the skin. You better go in and have Doc Fraser put something on your face. Coming from his carriage with a heavy service revolver, Dennis Peterson paused beside him. Yes, Dirk answered dully, and Dennis walked on to where two native grooms held Sundancer. Unsteadily on three legs, but quiet now, she stood between them with her head hanging dejectedly. Dennis touched the muzzle of the revolver to her forehead, and at the shot she recoiled violently and dropped, shuddering. Her legs stiffened in one last convulsion, then she lay still. Watching, Dirk shuddered in sympathy and then leaned forward to vent his nausea in the grass. It came up sour and scalding hot. He wiped it from his mouth with the palm of his hand. Then he began to walk, without direction, blindly, from the field toward the escarpment. Over in his mind, keeping pace with his legs like the refrain of a marching song. He doesn't want me. He doesn't want me. And then savagely, I hope he dies. Please let him die. Please let him die, Anna Courtney said it softly too, so that Gary, standing below her seat in the buggy, did not hear her. He stood with his shoulders hunched and his head thrust forward in thought, hands hanging at his side, slowly folding and unfolding. Then he raised one of them and squeezed the fingers into his closed eyelids. I'm going to him, he said. God help me, but I'm going to him. No! I forbid it. Leave him. Let him suffer as I suffered. Slowly, bewildered, Gary shook his head. I must. It's too long. Too much. I must. Pray God it's not too late. Let him die. Then suddenly it snapped in her head, broke under the weight of the hatred so long sustained. She rose, screaming in her seat, Die! Damn you, die! and Gary uncovered his eyes and looked up at her in alarm. Compose yourself, my dear. Die! Die! Her face was blotched with flaming spots of red, and her voice squawked as though she were being strangled. Gary scrambled up beside her and flung his arms around her protectively. Get away from me! Don't touch me! She screamed at him, fighting from his embrace. Because of you I lost him. He was so big, so strong. He was mine! 
and because— Anna, Anna, please don't, he tried to soothe her raving. Please stop it, my dear. And you, you crawling, crippled thing, because of you. And suddenly it had to come out, like pus from a canker. But I paid you back. I took him from you also, and now he's dead. You will never have him. She laughed, gloating, demented. Anna, stop it. Ah, that night. Do you remember that night? Will you or he ever forget it? I wanted him. I wanted him big like a bull on top of me. I wanted him rutting deep like it was before. I begged him. I pleaded. But because of you, because of his crippled little weakling brother, Christ, I hated him. She laughed again, a shriek of pain and hatred. I tore my clothing. I bit into my own lips, as I had wanted him to do. And when you came, I wanted you to, but you... Gah, I had forgotten you were only half a man. I wanted you to kill him. Kill him. Pale, so that the sweat on his face shone like water on white marble, Gary pulled away from her with loathing. All this time I thought he... I believed you. And he half fell from the buggy, leaning against it for a moment to steady himself. All this time wasted. Then he launched himself and began to run, his bad leg jerking and catching under him. You want a lift, Gary? Dennis Peterson drew level with him and called down from the carriage. Yes. Oh, yes. Gary caught the handrail and dragged himself up beside Dennis. Take me to him, please, as fast as you can. Chapter 87 Silent, deserted. The great house crouched over her, dark with the shutters closed against the sun, brooding and immense, smelling musty, as though old passions had died within its walls. Anna stood alone in the huge central room and screamed its name. Tyrannus Kral! And the thick stone walls smothered the sound of her madness. He is dead! Do you hear me? I took him away from all of you! and she shrieked in triumphant laughter, with the tears greasing her cheeks. I won! Do you hear me? I won! And her grief distorted the laughter. She picked up the heavy glass lamp and hurled it across the room. It burst, and the paraffin sprayed wide, glistening on the walls and soaking into the carpet. Tudus Kral, hear me! I hate you! I hate him! I hate you all, all of you! She raged through the room tearing down the gilt-framed pictures and smashing them so that the glass sparkled like tiny jewels in the gloom. She used a chair to smash in the front of the display cabinet and wreck the old china and glassware in it. She swept the books from the shelves into fluttering heaps and threw their torn pages in the air. I hate, she screamed, I hate! And the great house waited silent, exhausted with worn-out emotions, old and sad and wise. I hate you, all of you, and she ran out into the passage, through the kitchens, to the pantries. On the lowest shelf stood a four-gallon drum of methylated spirit, and she panted as she struggled with the stopper. The stopper came out, the clear liquid welled and ran down the metal sides, and she picked the drum up across her chest and stumbled back into the kitchen. It spilled down her skirt, soaking in, drenching the heavy cloth, forming a spreading pool on the stone flags. I hate, she laughed and stumbled, staggering off balance. Still clutching the drum, she fell against the kitchen range. Hot metal scorched her clothing and burned through to the flesh of her hip. But she did not feel it. Her sodden skirts brushed over the firebox. A tiny point of flame caught and grew. So when she ran on into the house, a fiery train swept behind her. Back in the central room, she poured from the drum over the books and the carpet, laughing as she splashed the long draped velvet curtains. Oblivious of the flames that followed, until her petticoats caught and burned against her legs. Then she screamed again at the agony of her tortured flesh and brain. She dropped the metal drum, and it exploded, showering her with liquid blue flame, turning her hair and her face and her whole body into a living torch. A torch that fell and writhed and died before the flames reached the thatch 
of the roof of Tunis Kral. Chapter 88 They faced each other across the waste of the Dow, and the bright sunlight threw their shadows along the filthy planking of the deck. Two tall young men, both dark-haired and burned rich brown by the sun, both with the big Courtney nose, both angry. From the poop, three of the Arab crew watched with mild curiosity. So you won't come home, then? Michael asked. You're going through with this childishness. Why do you want me to? Me? Good God, I... <laughs> if I never see you again, it would be too soon. Ladyburg will be a cleaner town without you. Then why did you come? Your father asked me. Why didn't he come himself? Dirk's bitterness echoed in his voice. He's still a sick man. His head hurt badly. If he wanted me, he would have come. He sent for you, didn't he? But why did he want you to win? Why did he stop me? Listen to me, Dirk. You're young yet. There are many things you don't understand. Oh, don't I? And Dirk threw back his head and laughed scornfully. Oh, I understand, all right. You'd better get off this boat. We're just about to sail. Listen, Dirk. Get off. Run back to him. You can have my share. Dirk, listen to me. He said if you refused to come, then I was to give you this. From inside his coat, Michael drew an envelope and offered it. What is it? I don't know, but I expect that it's money. Dirk came slowly across the deck and took the envelope from him. Have you a message for him? Michael asked. And when Dirk shook his head, he turned and jumped down onto the wooden jetty. Immediately a bustle began behind him as the Arab crew cast off the lines. Standing on the edge of the jetty, Michael watched the stubby little craft drift out on the waters of Durban Bay. He could smell the stench of her bilges, her sides were streaked with human filth, and the single sail that rose slowly as the crew hoisted the long teak boom was stained and patched like a quilt. The wind took her, and the pregnant belly of the sail bulged out. She heeled and thrust forward through the chop of dirty green water, headed towards the bar, where a low surf broke in languid lines of white. The two half-brothers stared at each other, across the widening gap. Neither of them lifted an arm or smiled. The Dow bore away. Dirk's face was a tiny brown fleck above the white of his tropical suit. Then suddenly his voice, Tell him! Small in the distance. Tell him! Tell! And the rest of it was lost on the wind, in the soft lap and sigh of the wavelets beneath the jetty. Chapter 89 Below where they sat on the lip of the escarpment, the walls of Tunis Kral stood up like smoke-brown tombstones, marking the burial ground of hatred. About time you started rebuilding, Sean grunted. You can't stay on at Proteus Street forever. No, Gary paused before going on. I've picked out the new site for the homestead. There, beyond the number two dip. Both of them looked away from the roofless ruins, and they were silent again until shyly Gary asked, I'd like you to have a look at the plans. It won't be as big as the old house now that there is just Michael and I. Could you... Good, Sean cut in quickly. Why don't you bring them across to Lion Cop tomorrow evening? Ruth will want you to stay for dinner. I'd like that. Come early, said Sean, and started to stand up from the rock on which he sat. He moved heavily, awkwardly, and Gary jumped up to help him. Hating the weakness of his slowly mending body, Sean would have brushed Gary's eager hands away, but he saw the expression on his brother's face, and instead he submitted meekly. Give me an arm over the uh, rough ground, please, he spoke gruffly. Side by side, with Sean's arm across Gary's shoulder, they moved to where the buggy waited. Ponderously, Sean climbed up and settled himself into the padded leather seat. Thanks. He gathered up the reins and smiled down at Gary, and Gary flushed with pleasure and looked away to the infinite lines of young wattle trees that covered the hills of Tunis Kral. Looks good, doesn't it? he asked. Uh, you and Michael have done wonders up there, Sean agreed, still smiling. 
Courtney Brothers and Son. Softly, Gary spoke the name of the new company, which had merged the lands of Tunis Kral and Lionkop into one vast estate. Now, at last, it is the way it should have been long ago. Until tomorrow, Gary. Sean flipped the reins, and the buggy rolled forward, rocking gently over the uneven surface of the new road. Until tomorrow, Sean, Gary called after him, and watched until the buggy was lost to sight among the blocks of dark, mature wattle. Then he walked to his horse and mounted. He sat a while, watching the distant ranks of Zulu labourers singing as they worked. He saw Michael moving on horseback amongst them, stopping occasionally to lean from the saddle and urge them on. And Gary began to smile. The smile smoothed away the lines from around his eyes. He touched the horse with his spurs and cantered down to join Michael. That is the end of The Sound of Thunder by Wilbur Smith. 